All right, everybody, so glad you're here worth worshiping with us this weekend. Hey, we want to take a minute. We want to welcome our Newcastle and Meadville campuses, those of you worshiping with us online, one church, multiple locations. Cranberry, would you welcome them? Come on. We love you all so much. So grateful. We're in the second of three weeks where we're talking about kingdom builders. And, uh, and, and literally the title is the same every week, but this, there's going to be a subtext every week. But it's simply this, is that kingdom builders make an impact. Kingdom builders make an impact. Now, when we talk about kingdom builders, uh, if you're not a part of Victory or you're new to Victory, that may be a little blind to you. You've heard a little bit about it throughout your service this morning, but let me just take a moment and, and remind you. Kingdom builders is what we do above our normal giving where we intend and we purposefully give in three directions, world mission projects, expanding God's kingdom in our own nation, in our own backyard, and then thirdly, investing in future Christian leaders. Last week, I talked to you about future Christian leaders. This week, I'm going to focus on the world missions and world mission projects. And, and I want to help you to understand that it isn't something we just, we aren't raising funds to do this. This is not a fundraiser. That's why we don't ask you to make a commitment through the year. All we do is show you what God is doing, what you are doing through your generosity, and ask you to simply hear his voice as we say over and over again. And you'll even understand more so why we say it is don't do the math do your part. And, and that'll make even more sense to you today. But I want to help you to understand specifically when we say world mission projects, there, it's next to impossible for me to have the time to go over the, all of those today. You can go to our website and look at the project guide under kingdom builders, and that'll be a great help to you. But let me just take a minute and let you help, help you know this. We are supporting right now through kingdom builders as we trust God for $2.5 million to come in by the end of the year. And remember, next year is the, next, next weekend is the impact offering where we trust God for each of us to bring our best gift and then to do our best throughout the end of the year to reach and surpass that goal. But right now through Kingdom Builders, you're supporting 29 ministries that around the world that are literally touching almost every inhabited nation on the earth through ministries that are doing such an incredible work and you are funding those ministries. One of them, I just you saw, of course, uh, uh, Scott and Krista Fletcher that are touching, the, 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 they're in the east where, of course, they're touching Vietnam, Laos, Cambodia, Myanmar, Thailand. It's an incredible work that they're doing. Another one is the ministry of Christopher Alam. I wanted to give you just, many of you have heard Christopher speak here. His given name at birth was Muhammad Alam, and he was converted from Islam and his father was a Pakistani general. And when his son converted, he had him arrested, put in prison. And when he would not recant, then they were going to kill him. And he escaped Pakistan and he ended up getting asylum in Sweden. And from there he walked with God. God called him and he's done ministry around the world. I've been on, had the privilege to travel with Christopher in Africa. And in Africa and in India just last year in the open air crusades and ministries that he does where he invites people to come and then hear the gospel. Over one half a million people gave their life to Jesus just this year. Come on. That's what you're doing as a kingdom builder. A half a million people just Africa in India, I want you to see the picture. That's one of the altar calls of one of the services. You funded that as a kingdom builder. Aren't you grateful to have a part? Aren't you grateful to have a part in the world of what God's doing? So incredible. What an honor it is. But that's Christopher's call is to, if you will, to touch the world from the bottom up, meaning those who are at the lowest level of the socioeconomic strata, coming into those and in, in, in valuing them and loving them and pouring his life into them and bringing Christ to them. But right on the other side of that equation, you're supporting John Maxwell's work where he's literally called to work from the top down in a nation. Right now, Maxwell is sitting on 23 invitations from presidents of nations where they're asking him to come and do what he's done in places like Guatemala and Paraguay and other nations. And I had the privilege of being with him in Paraguay. And one of the things that they're doing, and I'm just going to give you one little piece, is called the I Lead curriculum, where it's taking biblical values and teaching them to the entire nation from ju- in three years in their junior high years. And they go through this curriculum. And, and now it's throughout all of Guatemala, every school in Guatemala, every school in Paraguay. And soon in the nation of Brazil, which when I was with John, we went to Brazil for the initial meeting. The president of Brazil has now asked John to bring the I-League curriculum to, listen now, 
40 million students in Brazil are going to be hearing about the values of the kingdom of God in their public schools. That's what you're doing as a kingdom builder. It's incredible. And the I Lead curriculum actually is finding footing even in our own nation, in our own public schools, telling you, you are making an impact around the world, and it's incredible. Today, I want to talk to you about how to practically be a kingdom builder. Everybody say practical. Remember this. Religion is just impractical. Religion makes God obscure, opaque, like it doesn't matter. It's just something you do for an hour on a weekend if you can stomach it and go home. Honestly, let's be honest. That's what religion does to people. And like, ah, uh, you know, I could, uh, sleeping in is a little bit better for me. But I want to talk to you, not about a religion, but what does it mean to partner with God in your life where the God of the universe intimately, intimately, intimately partners with you to advance his kingdom in the earth? Not just as an individual, but as one, his body. So I want to be very practical and take you to four steps to giving the priceless gift, Jesus. Four simple steps to help you be practical in giving Jesus the priceless gift. Let me read to you the scripture that calls him that in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 15. Thank God for Jesus, the priceless gift, too wonderful for words. Why, why is Jesus called the priceless gift? Why is the mention of his name, the giftedness and the priceless gift that he got, gave to the earth, why is it too wonderful for words? Remember, gift means you can't earn this. Religion puts a price tag on what you get from God. In other words, you earn it. Jesus came, paid a price, a priceless price, the priceless son of God to give you a gift. And the moment you, the moment you earn a gift, it ceases to be one. So the first point is this. There is always a price in giving a priceless gift. There is always a price in giving a priceless gift. Religion will make that price start with you, but that's not true. The price didn't start with you. The price starts with God. I want you to listen to what the scripture said about the price Jesus paid for you and for me. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 18 says this. For you know that God paid a ransom to save you from the empty life you inherited from your ancestors. And the ransom he paid was not mere silver or gold. Your ransom price was the precious blood of Christ, the sinless, spotless Lamb of God. Now, very often you can come into a church service, even some of the songs we sang today, and you hear songs about Jesus' blood, and you're kind of, you might be thinking, really? Isn't that, that's kind of graphic. Why? What, what does he mean, the sinless, spotless Lamb of God? You see, the price that Jesus paid was the price that you should have paid and I should have paid. Remember this, that God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit are one God, three distinct personalities. You say, well, I don't know that I can understand that. Well, he's God and you're not. How many of you think it's okay for the creation not to wrap their mind fully around the creator? Is that all right? You say, well, no, I need to understand everything. You've got a long wait. If you're anybody married? Anybody that's male married to a woman? Anybody? Anybody? Bueller? Bueller? Anybody? We've been married going on 35 years next June, and I'm telling you, I still don't understand my wife. Ask her, she'll tell you. I'm working on it. But here's what I want you to see. I need you to gain some understanding that God himself is so righteous and so holy that sin can never be in his presence. And when man sinned and when sin fell to me and to you, we were separated from God, and there's no way back. You cannot, pay your, you cannot ransom yourself out of that debt. And God in his righteousness judged me guilty and condemned me to a sentence of eternity apart from him in a place of torment. But that he so loved me that he came born of a virgin for one reason, so that God could wrap himself in human flesh, so that Christ, the sinless, spotless lamb of God, could hang on a cross 
And all of the wrath of God that was due you and me fell to him. God judged you guilty, judged me guilty. And then he sent his son and poured all the wrath and all the punishment that was due us on himself. And he hung on that cross and was executed in my place. He died in my place. He was buried in my place. And then he rose from the dead and offers you, now listen, the free gift of eternal life. That's how desperately God loves you. The reason we'll tell you 10,000 times over about the love of God is that if you don't get that centrally just baked into your soul, you will make God a dead religion. Jesus is the priceless gift. If you are going to be a kingdom builder, if you're going to give the priceless gift Jesus to the earth, you've got to understand this, that there is always a price in giving a priceless gift. Everything on this earth can be assigned monetary value. Everything. There's not one piece of artwork that if it were available to be sold, if a museum would sell it, that there couldn't, it couldn't be quantified with a monetary price. It may be called priceless in that it can't be replaced, but it's not priceless in that someone can't attach a monetary value to it. But Jesus coming to the earth is a priceless gift. Let me explain it this way. If I were to say to you or ask any of you to take one of your children and give their life to save the life of someone else's child, and you gave that gift, that is a gift without price. You can't quantify that gift. It's priceless. And that's what God did. But he didn't do it for his neighbor. He didn't do it as it were. You would think, gosh, I'd have to love someone so much to do that, and they have to be so close to me. I can't fathom ever doing it, but if I did it, God did it for his enemies. The Bible said that we were enemies against him, and our minds had become wicked. And yet Christ died for the ungodly. He didn't do this for those who loved him. He did it for those who opposed him. There is a price to the priceless gift. And if you don't understand the price that was paid for you, you'll never value sharing Christ. You'll be limited. You'll, you'll, you'll be self-conscious. But if you're going to be a kingdom builder, if you're going to take the resources of your life and pour them into others, remember, step one is that there's, there's always a price. There's always a price in giving a priceless gift. And please remember this. Jesus came to redeem and restore a family, not start a religion. And that's what he wants you to do with your life, individually and together as a church. Here's the second thing. The second step is this. What breaks God's heart must break mine. Second point. What breaks God's heart must break mine. Let me tell you of two of the ministries, uh, one specifically, one is general, that you're doing in world missions with kingdom builders. You've heard us talk, if you've been a part of Victory, about the House of Palms, which is in India, in northern India. The House of Palms, we, we have fully funded the building of one of, those, uh, one of those houses. But because of the persecution in India, the new laws that have been enacted, Christians are being persecuted, particularly in northern India, to the extent that they are being martyred for their faith. And so the, the construction was delayed because it, it had some Christian connotation because once the kids get in the home, and I'll explain what the home does if you're unaware in a moment, that it was delayed for that reason. But they've been able to get around it and the construction has started for the House of Palms that you already paid for and are continuing to fund its operation. In the, uh, now, we, there are already two of them in this community. And let, let me explain to you what the House of Palms is if you're, if you, if you're unfamiliar. The House of Palms is in a village where they have a 500-year tradition of fathers prostituting their daughters and their wives for income. They're on, the little village is on a, a thoroughfare where trucks pass by. And I've seen the photos of it. And when the House of Palms is finished, I, I believe probably Pastor Steve or I may lead a trip. We're going to go over and we're going to take some of you with us who want to go. And we want you to experience what you're doing there. And if you were to see some of the photos when you drive by, there's a little hut where they live. In front of the hut is just a, a, a bed that's kept out front, which is to let you know that as you're driving by, this is a place of prostitution. 
and truckers will stop, and a father will give that his daughters as young as eight years old and younger for that reason, for income. It's one of the most horrific practices that know, known to human beings. Now, the House of Palms takes those children from the families, and they literally are raised in the House of Palms. Say, why would a parent let that happen? Because that child is fully educated and will be able to make more money with an educated life than they would ever make through that horrible practice. And it's not because they love the child. And, and you are about to, we're about to complete construction where about 80 of these girls are going to be rescued from that lifestyle. And it sh- you can understand why it shortens their lives. And I, I don't want, obviously don't want to be graphic. This is, there are different ages in this room. That's what you're doing as a kingdom builder. What if that was your daughter? That's somebody's child. That's God, it, how his heart breaks And when what breaks his heart breaks yours, being a kingdom builder and and being generous with your resources is a natural response. You're supporting orphanages in multiple nations. You've helped build one specifically in, in the Philippines because children matter to God and you're doing this with your kingdom building giving. This isn't, some. this is changing the lives of human beings forever. Let me take you to a scripture where you see the heart of Jesus so clearly. In Luke 19, verse 41, it said, but as they came closer to Jerusalem. Now remember, this is when Jesus is just about to enter the city to give his life for you and me. He's in, going into Jerusalem to die for your sins. In a few days, he will be crucified. But as they came closer to Jerusalem and Jesus saw the city ahead, Jesus began to weep. Now, if you... If you study the Greek language, I'm not a Greek authority, but I can study language. The word weep doesn't mean, you know, kind of like, that. you ever, like sometimes Michelle might be somewhere and it's really touching and she'll start crying and she'll do this. And then there's ugly cry. You know what ugly cry is, right? I mean, your face contorts, I mean, your heart's broken. This isn't Jesus. This is Jesus ugly cried. He is if you will, grieving and weeping like someone who's someone's dead. I want you to see this is because of the words you're about to hear Jesus say weren't said in this tone of voice. They were said through the sobs of tears. And listen, please. Here's what he said through his tears. How I wish today that you, speaking of the Jews, of all people would understand the way to peace with God. But now it's too late. And peace with God is hidden from your eyes. In the days of head, your enemies are going to bring up their heavy artillery, one translation says, and surround you, pressing in from every side. They will crush you to the ground and your children with you. Your enemies will not leave a single stone in place because you did not accept your opportunity for salvation. Jesus was prophesying an event that would happen in 70 AD when the Romans came into Jerusalem and literally just wiped it out and tried to murder every living Jew and did the ones they could find. Jesus, knowing what would happen in the future, going into a city where the very people that he's weeping over are about to instigate putting him on a cross. And he stops and he weeps. Not for himself, but for their future. He saw the consequences of their actions. And instead of him being enraged against them and speaking against them, and this is what you deserve, even though what they did was unrighteous, he wept over their consequences, even though their consequences were their own choice. That's the heart of God for people. He didn't get enraged about their tomorrow. He saw that their, they, their wives, their children were going to be physically, the people he was going to see would be dead shortly. And he broke over it to where he wept and he wept and really nobody knew but he because he never told them the specifics of what would happen. Jesus wept over the painful consequences of their sin. Here's a question I want to ask myself and I do and I ask this and I ask it of you. Do I do the same? 
when I see a culture broken, when I see a culture so devastatingly broken, does my heart break for people or do I just get enraged? Such a trap that Christians have fallen into today, and it's an easy one, that we've replaced the heart of God with anger, with the emotion of rage, where we point a finger at groups of people. And we pray the prayer of the Pharisee that Jesus said, the Pharisee prayed. Here was the, Phar- the Pharisee's prayer, the Pharisees of whom inspired the death of Jesus on a cross. Here was the prayer of a Pharisee. Jesus said they pray with themselves, not with God. And he said they pray thus with themselves. They strike their breasts and say this, God, I thank you that I'm not like those people. That's the prayer of a Pharisee. It is totally absent the heart of God. And if you aren't careful, if I'm not careful in this broken culture, that will become my prayer. And we will make the object of his love the object of our derision and our anger. And we will make who he died for our enemy. If you're going to be a kingdom builder, your heart must break for what breaks his. A couple of weeks ago, I was in the mall with Michelle. And I do my best not to go there. Um, it's just because I grew up with four brothers, that's all. And we never did that kind of stuff. And my wife will say to me, honey, you're an insensitive person sometimes. And I say, it's my brother's fault. And uh, I said, that was fine the first decade. Um, but uh, anybody married here? Okay, well, let's get back to the mall. And so we're at the mall. I go into a store because Michelle said, you need shoes. I say, why does she tell you that? Because she's right. I would never buy another thing as long as I live. And she's like, baby, listen, you can't keep wearing the same thing every day of your life. I said, it's clean. Anybody married? Okay. So I go into the shoe store. Uh, there's nothing really there that I could like. And I, uh, you know. Then I look up, and, and I see that the young man behind the counter is dressed fully like a woman, his head shaved on one side, the side has a long, he has full makeup on, he has high heels on. And I asked him about a certain size shoe and they didn't have it. And when he spoke to me, something happened in my heart. This wasn't in my head. It, it, I felt God's heart for this kid. And I'm trying to compose myself because, now I'm not a, I'm not a crier. The older I get, the easier I cry. But I used to say, man, I have to pull out a good nose hair to drop a tear, you know? <laughs> ah, ah, and then a tear. Y'all know what I mean. It's just like, I, it just didn't come naturally. But instead of looking at that young man and judging and criticizing him, I felt God's heart for him. And I, be, I, couldn't, I couldn't contain it. And I'm thinking, I've got to get out of here because I, I can't stop this. And I'm trying to get out of the store just so I can find, because it's just like, it, it's coming and I can't stop this. When you see the brokenness of humanity, the only difference between them and me is him. That's it. That I've been rescued. And he desperately wants to love, serve, and rescue that young man, not just through his heart, but mine. Does my heart break for what breaks his? If that isn't real in my life, it, you'll never be a kingdom builder. And God wants you to have that intimacy with him. The third, the third step is simply this. I must work as one with other believers. I must work as one with other believers. One. We're in a very individualistic society. And, and, and it's one of the outcomes of freedom. And it's a wonderful thing that you get the freedom to live your life and to choose. But the reality of it is, is God didn't call me to live as an individual. He called me to live as a part of his body. There's a story that's told of a village that the king was going to come and he was coming to all the small villages in his kingdom and each village wanted to give the king a gift to honor him. And the village came together and they knew that the king loved a certain type of wine that was very, very expensive. And they thought, you know, we could give him a full vat of this wine, even though we're poor, if each of us would just go buy one chalice of it ourselves. And we'll leave the vat out in the open and you can just come and, and pour yours in and we'll be able as a group to give him an entire vat 
of, his, of the wine that he loves the most, and we will give him an incredible gift. And they all agreed. The king shows up a week later. They, they pour some wine from the vat, and he knows that he's, he's going to have this. This is your gift, and they, and they gave it to him, knowing he was about to taste the wine that he loved. He took one sip, and he threw the, the, the chalice down and spit it out. And people were, why, why would you do that? But here's what happened. People in the village thought, there are three or four hundred of us here. They're going to do this. I don't have to go buy mine. I'll just put water in. It'll just be a little. It'll only dilute a little. He'll never know. And I won't have to, I, I won't have to be a part of the whole. I, I, I don't have to do that. But what ended up happening is half the people brought water. And they dishonored the king because somehow they thought their part didn't matter. That is what stops the kingdom of God from expanding. Is that you and I don't understand we are a part of the whole and every part matters. Listen to what the scripture says in 1 Corinthians 12, 27. All of you together, say it out loud together. All of you, all of you together are Christ's body. All of you. And each of you is an individual part of it. One scripture said, and Jesus placed you into his body where it pleased him. Your part in the body matters. And the reason God compares the body of Christ to the human body is they function very similarly. Jesus is the head of the church. He gives a direction and the body follows through. Imagine if the human body operated like that village or God's people. About 20% of God's people do about 80% of the work of the kingdom because the others are bringing a glass of water. Because they, not because they just don't care. They just don't think it matters. But imagine if my body worked that way. If my lungs this morning said, I'm, I, I'm not that necessary. The whole body dies because of it. That's why the Bible said when one part of the body suffers, the whole body suffers. I've, my, I one time stubbed my baby toe where I almost ripped it off my body. It was a bad day. And my rest of my body didn't. It's just a toe. Shut up. My whole body stopped. And my whole body, I mean, we were, all of us were paralyzed. That's why you said you weep with those that weep in a body. You rejoice with those that rejoice. If you're going to be a kingdom builder, you have to understand, I must work as one with other believers. Being an individual makes it about my success. Success is about me. Significance is what I do beyond me for others. A self-focus and a life of significance are totally incompatible. You cannot do both. You cannot do both. If you're going to be a kingdom builder, you're going to have to learn to live outside the borders and boundaries of your own wants, your own privileges, your own pain, your own pleasure, and your own needs. And you're going to have to live with an outside focus just like God does. But living a life of significance will give you 10,000 times more over than you will ever give out. Once you've experienced through your obedience in God's kingdom and your obedience in giving into the kingdom of God, in this context, in, in funding kingdom builders, once you experience the life change, you'll never go back. You'll never go back to living that half-life of success. You'll crave for this, you'll hunger for it, and you'll never move away from it because you will see a life transformed by the power of God because you've chosen to not live a self-focused life but a life of significance and realizing that you are a part of the whole and you bringing a glass of water instead of the wine will cause the king to be given something diluted. But the king isn't your ruler. Your king is your savior who paid the price for your soul. Kings oppress and use people and, and, and rule over them. Jesus is a king, but he's a king that became a suffering Messiah. And I want to help you to see as a kingdom builder that God has called you not just to 
tell people about Jesus in your private life and to be a witness in the way you live and the way you converse with people. But he's called you to also send others to do it. Everyone is two things as a Christian. You're called in Christ's body to be a sender and, if you will, a goer yourself. All of us have a call to our own individual sphere of influence to represent Christ. And I don't mean by getting up on a chair where you work and saying, come to Jesus. I mean, just be, be who you are and let the light in you cause people to ask you about it and tell your story. But for every one of us, you are called also to be a sender. The book of Romans says it this way. How can they preach the gospel unless, listen, they are sent? And you send with your giving. And so I want to encourage you as a believer. You send, if you will, with your money. You go with your own life. And I want to encourage all of us to understand that next weekend's impact offering is, is our center focus of when we bring our best gift. But right on through the end of the year, we give. And, and you say, well, but, 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 but how much is in and how much do we need? We're going to give you numbers, but here's the deal. This is why I'm saying to you over and over again, don't do the math. Do, your part. say it again, do your, part. all the campuses. Don't do the math. Do your part because you are a part of the whole. It isn't, what's my part in the fundraiser? This is not a fundraiser. It's the body of Christ. It's the head of the church saying, go reach them, go tell them, go send them. The people I've sent across this world to tell them about my son, go, go, and now send them. Kingdom builders, you are senders. God has called you with your finances to be a river, not a reservoir. He's called you to be a river, not a reservoir with your talent, your ability, and your finances. That's the privilege of being in the body of Christ, not the burden. And the fourth point is simply this. I must leave my comfort zone and live beyond myself. If I'm going to give the priceless gift Jesus to the earth, if I'm going to be a kingdom builder, I must leave my comfort zone and live beyond myself. That's why Jesus said this. Where your treasure is, your heart will be also. So I don't know where my heart is. Look where you spend your money. I'll tell you where your heart is. Jesus told you. Where you spend your money, that's where your heart is. Anybody have children? How many of your your, your kids, how much of your treasure went into kids? Kids are expensive. But you don't do that for your neighbor's kids because your, your treasure isn't going there because your heart isn't there. God gives us the privilege to labor together with him. His heart becomes our heart. And Jesus said, it will be the natural thing if your heart is connected to mine. If you've received the love that I am for you and respond back, your treasure will follow your love, not your religion. Love what he loves. Let your heart break for what breaks his. Remember this, generosity is not an amount of money. Generosity is obedience to God. For some of us, generosity means that we're, we're going to be giving into kingdom builders sacrificially that we're not going to be getting certain things that we want. That's how we're going to do it. I, I, I'm not wealthy. I don't have a, a, a bank, if you will, of, of resources to go take out of to put into kingdom builders. So things that we would normally do for ourselves, we're going to do for others. That's how most of you will do your kingdom builders giving like us. Then there's some of you, God has entrusted you with great wealth. I said, God has entrusted you with great wealth. It's not yours. It is his. Nothing's yours. Not even your life. The scripture said that we are to glorify God with our body and with our spirit, listen, which belong to God because you have been purchased with a price, the priceless blood of Christ. I don't give God anything that he didn't give me. Everything I have, I steward toward him. That's why I tell you tithing isn't giving, it's stewardship. Kingdom building is stewarding what God has entrusted to you. There will be people under the sound of my voice that God will touch your heart to give multiplied tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, and millions into kingdom builders and into the future. So why would somebody do that? Because they're part of the body. They're doing the part the head of the church tells them. Don't do the math to your part I want you to simply do this give in a manner 
that requires you stewarding what God has entrusted to you, not another person. Don't presume what another. Seek God for yourself. That's my prayer for all of us. It's what Michelle and I are praying about right now because we give monthly toward kingdom builders and it's, 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 a, it's one of the largest things in our budget monthly. It really is. And in fact, it's the second largest thing we do in our budget every month, secondarily to our mortgage. And then we're going to do something on top of that because we're stewarding something and we're praying about God, what do we do? Let, let me show you in Mark chapter eight of scripture as we wind down. A very misunderstood scripture. Jesus, when he called the people to himself with his disciples also, he said to them, whoever desires to come after me, how many of you want to follow Jesus? Whoever desires to come after me, listen now, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, say out loud daily, and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life, now listen, for my sake and the gospel's, that's telling people about the good news, will save his life. When most people think of pick, take up your cross daily, deny yourself, and follow Jesus, they think Jesus is asking you to come to a religious life of self-torture. Then my whole life I'll have to live and never do what I want. I'll never get to experience joy. It's a life of just utter torture. Self, I mean, I have, to, I have to be on a cross every day as a Christian. And that's what they think he meant. That's not what he meant at all. What he simply said was, if you're going to follow me, everybody say follow me. If you're going to come after me, you have to deny yourself, take up your cross daily and follow me. He said, because here's why. When you don't, you think you're saving your life, but you will lose it. But when you do, for my sake and the gospels, you'll find it. Jesus is saying, follow me in my purpose and deny yourself to do it. He's not telling you you can't enjoy your life. He said, I've come to give you life and life abundantly. Religion tells you that stupidity. He said, if you're going to follow me, though, you're going to have to deny yourself. You're going to have to do it daily. And Kingdom Builders is a perfect picture of following Jesus with your giving. Deny yourself. Take up your cross and follow him. And he said, when you try to save your resource of your life, your money, your time, what, your talent, you will lose it. But if you partner with me for the kingdom's sake, if you partner with me to get the gospel to the world, to the people that I shed my blood for, you will find your life because you have now labored together with me. And God and kids is a decent business plan. And he said, the scripture, the scripture said very clearly that when you give, he said, I'll multiply back to you. Why? Because you're partners. How many think God's rate of return is better than anything you've ever thought of? It has nothing to do with money. It has to do with purpose. You are a kingdom builder. Your part matters. Finally, if you've been coming to victory any length of time, you've heard me talk about a pastor that um, actually that Michelle's brother and sister-in-law, Scott and Christo, have been a part of his life for a very long time. He's in one of the nations of four that I mentioned. I have to leave it vague. This is the picture of him. And his, his face is, uh, is marked out for, for obvious reasons because the, 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 the persecution in those nations have risen greatly. He was arrested a while back and, and brought to a, a, a local prison, then sent to a provincial prison. And many of you have heard about this. We've told you the story. We've been praying for him. But this precious pastor was brought from the local prison to the provincial prison, which means you may never see him again. And he was there for 55 days, I believe. And the first 14 days, they tortured him for his faith. Because this man that you see pastors the house churches. He is the lead head pastor over so many house churches. And he works a job as well. But this is the only way that the church can work is underground. And they discovered who he was and they arrested him and they tortured him for 14 days. And then his family would have never known that until they let him out in 55 days later. Aren't you grateful that he's he's been out of that place? He's set free. I'm grateful. Thank you, God. He came right back and he's doing the same thing he did when they arrested him. 
He's taking up his cross daily. He's following Jesus. He asked me to give money. This man's being asked to give his life. These are people of whom this world is not worthy that I have the privilege to support as a kingdom builder. While he was in prison, you were caring for his family with your finances. We are one body. That man didn't come back and say, I'm done. I'm done. I can't deal with this. He picked it right back up and said, we, if they're going to have to kill me, I will bring Jesus to my nation. That's what kingdom builders do. And that's who you're supporting in kingdom builders. This is not a silly fundraiser to make Christians feel good. This is changing the world through the gospel of Jesus Christ and you are a kingdom builder. And next week, I want you to pray about what the best God would have you to do. And then through the end of the year, we'll let you know where we're at in the total. And we are gonna believe God to so surpass the 2.5 million and every penny of it will go right out to ministries and missions around the world before the year's end. We empty that account every year and you're going to make some people really happy around the world. And you guys get to make the calls if you've seen the videos. It's a blast. But before I pray for all of us as kingdom builders, let me pivot and make certain that everybody under the sound of my voice has had the opportunity to give their life to Jesus. With every head bowed and eye closed at all of our campuses, I want to pray for you. If you're at our campuses or online and you've never given your life to Christ, I'm not asking you if you're a good person. That's wonderful. I'm not asking you if you go to a church. That's fine. I'm not asking you if you've received the sacrament of a church. That's wonderful. But no church, no amount of good effort, no sacrament of any church, including this one, can make you right with God. Only by receiving the one who paid the debt for you, Jesus. In the book of Revelation, Jesus promises that he turns no one away, that if you open your heart to him, he, listen, turns no one away. No one away. And he, he will come, and you get the choice today to receive the Savior, the priceless gift, or to reject him. That's not God's choice. It's yours today. So with every head bowed and every eye closed, if you were to die today and stand before a holy God, and you're, what would you say to him? Because the only thing that will get you into the presence of God for eternity is receiving the sacrifice of his son who will wipe your sin dead away. If you've never done that or you're not sure and you believe that Jesus is the son of God, that he died on the cross to pay your sin debt, he was buried in your place, he rose from the dead in your place and now offers you, listen to these words, the free gift, free gift of eternal life. And he turns no one away. If you want to receive him, to be the savior of your life and then follow him as as the Lord of your life. He turns no one away. He comes simply for the asking. So with heads bowed and eyes closed at all of our campuses, if you'd like to receive Christ, I'll pray for you right where you're at. In fact, all the congregations will pray the prayer out loud together with you right where you're seated. This isn't about your heroics. It's about his. No one's going to single you out or embarrass you. This isn't about your promises, but his. If you've never given your life to Christ or you aren't sure and you say, I want to know before I leave this place today. If you're watching online, this is for you as well. Put it down in the comments. I'm praying with Pastor John. I want to know that Jesus is the Lord of my life and I don't. And I want to invite him into my life. With every head bowed and every eye closed, I'm going to ask you right now, simply right where you're seated at all the campuses, simply to raise your hand where I can see it or the campus pastors can see it. Do it right now and then we're going to pray together as congregations. Do it right now, right now, right now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. Let me look one last moment here at, at, at this campus. This campus pastors are looking where, where you are. If you've not yet raised your hand, say, please include me. I see you're not singling anybody out. Please include me in that prayer, Pastor. Lift your hand high so I can see it, then put it back down, and I'll pray for you as well. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. God bless you. You can put your, your hands back down here and at all the campuses. Pray this out loud where you hear it. Jesus will come into your life. He will never leave you and forsake you. He'll make you brand new. Your sin debt will be gone. And we'll all pray it together with you. Pray it out loud where you hear it. Say it out loud where you hear it, and we'll pray it together with you. Say, Heavenly Father, I come to you in the name of Jesus. And I believe with all my heart that Jesus is the Son of God. He died on a cross to bear my sin debt. I open the door of my heart and my life And Jesus, I invite you in. 
I receive you now to be my Savior and Lord. Thank you for coming. I am now a child of God and my sin debt is canceled and I will follow you all the days of my life. And when I die, I am heaven bound because Jesus is the Lord of my life. Amen, amen. All the campuses, give them a hand, would you? Best decision of your life. Before we dismiss today, we're going to take just a few moments and do something at all of our campuses. I'm going to ask all the worship teams at all of our campuses to simply sing a song of worship. But I don't want you to participate at our campuses. I want you to stay seated. And I want you to pray. God, what would you have me to do as a kingdom builder? What do you have for me? And as they sing this through, open your heart. Let the God of all creation speak to your soul whether it be sacrificial, whether it be out of your abundance, don't tip God. Don't just give him, well, you know, we can do that. We won't miss this. Miss something, please. Take up your cross and follow him. Give to a place to where you miss it and you will find life. That's what Jesus said about the kingdom. That's what kingdom builders do. So pray. I'm going to pray. Michelle and I are still praying over our gift. You pray over yours. And we're going to so far surpass that goal in the name of Jesus, I trust. And do our part to shake the world for Christ. Just bow your heads right where you are. Create a little altar, if you will, right where you're seated at all of our campuses. I'm going to turn it over to the the, the worship teams at the campuses right now. And here at Cranberry, we're going to worship. Come on. Pray as they worship. Father, I pray over every person under the sound of my voice that they will hear your voice, they will honor what you put in their heart and that they'll simply obey you. Father, I thank you for the priceless gift of the Savior. Break our hearts with what breaks yours. Help us to grasp an intimacy with you where that happens. Help us to understand that we work together as one. We work together as one. And my glass of water matters, or my glass of wine, that every child of God would bring their glass of, of wine to the vat for the king as you direct them. Help us to leave our comfort zone, Father, and live beyond ourselves today and make an impact in our world so that someday when we enter heaven, that we see tens of millions of people that otherwise would not be there as heaven is populated and as hell is plundered and we spend eternity with people that we did our part to send the gospel to. Thank you for that privilege. Father, I pray that over every person under the sound of my voice. I worship you. I worship you. Let's just sing that chorus together one time through. I worship you. I worship you. I hear you call. I worship you. Sing it one more time.
time through. Sing it as a prayer out of your heart. Father, I thank you for your presence in this place. As prayer partners make their way right now down to the front as we dismiss in a moment in prayer, I want to encourage you, if you have any needs in your life, meet with a prayer partner. If you prayed to receive Jesus with me today, please, with that QR code on the front of your seat, put your camera on that. Follow the prompts. Let us know so we can help you. Take your next steps in God. Don't, don't run out of here. If you have any needs in your life, prayer partners are here. We believe in a living God that meets people right where they are, a God of miracles. So let me pray over you. Pray over next week's impact offering. Pray over all of us being kingdom builders as we come together as God's people. Aren't you grateful to be loved by the Father? Aren't you grateful for his goodness in your life? He's so faithful. Father, I bless your people in the name of Jesus. And I thank you for those that gave their life to Christ today at all of our campuses and online that they'll take a next step with you. For those that are receiving prayer, that you will meet them supernaturally where they are. For nothing is impossible with you. We go our way grateful for a Savior. In Jesus' name, kingdom builders. Amen, amen, amen. We love you so much.